Hi there and welcome to the YouTube channel. I am Martin from Panasonic Nordic and with me I have Sebastian. Hello. So today we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects and objects <laughs> and that's the GH5, the legendary. I might and have to stop gonna, a bit today. Yeah, you're going to have to stop me because I'm going to just go on and go on. So we're going to talk about why this little bad boy is still amazing, awesome, and quite a filmmaker's dream, I would say, because this camera has changed the workflow for so many uh, photographers and, and especially filmmakers. So we're going to try to go through the ins and outs of this camera and talk about generally why this is still so popular and a really hot video tool. Right, so um, first of all, I'm going to talk about the stills photography side of things because I think that this camera is a little bit forgotten in terms of photography uh, and I think just because there is so much talk about video with this camera. It is a very, very video centric camera and for that matter I think we sometimes forget to talk about how good it is in photo. So we're going to show you some, some uh, footage and we're going to show some uh, pictures here today. Uh, most of which I captured about two years ago. I was going to Lofoten Islands in Norway to, uh, to shoot a documentary, a short one, uh, about 15 meters long. Uh, about uh, a friend of mine who uh, is a very professional uh, cyclist and um, a biker guy. But he also has a, a very rare disease called Edison's disease. So I was doing this movie to try to help people with this disease and raise awareness around that subject. So it's a totally non-profit. Uh, it's Team Edison uh, that we're going to see here in the picture. So I'm going to first start off and just show some inspiration from this uh, footage that we have. We also encourage you to go in there in the live chat and chat with us. We're going to try to answer everything. Uh, so at any time, if you possible. have any questions, please write them in chat. Or if you see that our yeah. lip sync or something like that is a bit weird, so we can adjust it as we go. Right. So let's first talk about image quality and, and photography and landscape photography because I think this camera is fantastic for landscape photography. I think there's a lot of users out there not really thinking that a micro four th third sensor can really um, hold up that well in, in landscape photography, especially when you have so much dynamic range to think about. And I'm just going to want to show you a few pictures where I think we can challenge that because the dynamic range of this camera is just fantastic. There are a lot of other cameras on the market that doesn't have this dynamic range. Um, and so I think for, for general photography, like portraits and studio uh, product photography and landscape, this camera is, is really good, doing a good job, a really great job. So um, with that said, I'm going to also head over to um, the reason why I think the GH5 is so amazing. I think it's basically the size of the camera, the portability, and also the fact that you can just pack it into the bag like you can see on the picture here. What I was doing when I was shooting that short documentary in, in Lofoten, I really didn't want to have too much stuff with me, so that's what I did. I just packed the bag uh, checked it in on the plane, um, didn't really check it in, I brought it with me on the plane. We didn't want to have too much stuff with us because I think sometimes that can be quite limiting. So first of all we decided not to have the gimbal with us when we shot the, the short up there because one of the biggest selling argument with the GH5 would be the stabilizer which is totally fantastic, it's amazing. So you can pull off a lot of shots just with the camera, with your lens, and nothing else. You don't always need a rigging even. So, uh, so I'm gonna, yeah, sure. 
the the pictures you showed us uh, just now did yeah. you use a lot of bracketing to get that dynamic range no actually i didn't um oh. that was just raw files and there's even i think i have it here one of the pictures i shot was i think it's this one here was just a jpeg so it's, That's it's great a to lot know, of dynamic so you range. Don't have to carry with you a tripod and everything like that if you're going for a light setup. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. And to get back to this um, with the stabilizer, how you can actually use it for especially videography without a gimbal. Um, I'm going to show a few clips here from the movie. Uh, here you can see how how a lot of the stuff was shot, uh, just just using uh, some some filters with a filter pack in the front, ten by fifteen centimeter filters. Um, but also a lot of stuff was just shot from the trunk of the car. We had a, a a car with a quite large trunk, so I just sat back there and and shot just like this. Uh, and I even switched lenses when I was sitting back there. Um, which I, I maybe shouldn't recommend because I, there's a lot of dust and stuff coming in there. But I was just doing it very quick. I had a, a pillow with me, so I could just take some um, some support from that. But other than that, I didn't have any um, uh, cage or anything on the camera. I just had a camera and two lenses with me there. So I had a 1260, and I also had a 100-400 lens, which is a really good telephoto lens. So I'm going to show the first clip here. Um, which show both some of the bike scenes and also um, just just some kind of static scenes where I would just move the camera uh, without a gimbal. So I'm gonna, just going to start this here. So um, I think it's quite amazing to be able to just shoot with like 800 millimeters from the trunk of your car. I don't think those shots were really shot with up to 800, but I have another clip that I'm going to show soon here uh, where I shot actually at 800 millimeter, fully zoomed in with the 100-400 lens. And I quickly just switched over to the 1260 uh, because the biker was coming so close and I wanted to have a wider shot. So. What I love about the camera and the workflow you get from the Gage 5 is just the ability to, to shoot really uh, spontaneous like that. You don't have to plan so much because it's so, so easy to carry with you and, and do those, pull off those shots. So I'm going to head over to the next clip here. It's about, I think, one minute long, where you're going to see uh, a few different scenes where I go from the 1260 to the 100 I also want to say just also that I brought a lot of stuff. I can take that picture again here, show you with uh, the stuff I brought. I have here a super wide angle. I have the 42.5 Noctichron lens and I have a 12 millimeter 1.4, but I rarely used them for this, um, for this documentary. Just because I just love the 1260 so much, just giving you that flexibility and also the pictures I got from it was just fantastic. So the 1260 Leica, I think that's a lens to, to really consider if you want to buy this camera, buy it with that lens. It's going to be one of your favorite. So yes. even if it's, it's tempting have, to think... I uh, have just started uh, uh, to do more film, uh, of course, yeah. because of this channel as well. And I have realized yeah. that the 12 to 60 doesn't have any focus breathing. And no, it's that's right. actually... Yeah. I don't know if we advertise it as such, but it seems parafocal. Yeah, it is parafocal by uh, software. So okay. it's actually correcting for that because if we had made it parafocal by design, by optical design, I think it should be a lot bigger and a lot mm -hmm. more advanced. So it's working really well if you're uh, zooming not too fast because then you could lose that tracking for, for a short minute, short moments. Uh, so I'm going to show the next clip here, which is um, 
showing different scenes from different angles and stuff. But most of it was shot from the car, the trunk of the car. So there we go. I started to exercise again. I felt better with the release of endorphins. Somewhere along, I rediscovered it. An old, solid invention I had used many times before. The bicycle. That right here, that was 800 millimeter. So when you shoot this scene, uh, the freedom. Are you doing it in 4K 10 bit? The sights. Uh, just do, do you use and a, of course, the crop function? The rush to get the of adrenaline. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell that just in a few seconds. So here I'm backing out actually with the 1260 because he was coming up so close. So I was backing out. I was zooming back out with the 1260. So yeah, um, that's a very good question, Sebastian. Uh, I was shooting uh, most of this stuff, I think, in 4K 8 bits 50p and vlog. So I was going against my own recommendation because I think it's, it's mostly, I want to recommend shooting in 10 bits with vlog. But I, I just, I was testing and I saw that everything was working out great. It was, it was kind of a, a, a very good lighting. It was all just natural. It was uh, uh, sunlight, and we we had a a quite. Um, it was just working very well to shoot eight bits. Just to put it that way. It's also a little bit dependent on what kind of grading you have. If you want to do a lot of advanced grading, maybe it's not a good idea to to shoot eight bit vlog. So that I think brings us into. I think you have also in your question, why shoot vlog and why shoot yeah. 10 bits? Because that's one of the big features of this camera, right? Yes. Yeah, so why it's so important to be able to shoot 10 bits? First of all, uh, that is for the post-production. So if you want to do post-production, you want to go 10 bits, period. If you want to do really advanced post-processing like HDR editing or for cinema use, for instance, you need to use 10 bits. There's no way you can pull it off with 8 bits. Now, this was not shoot, shot for a feature film. This was a, a quite simple um, workflow just to get it out there on the internet. But I was really happy with the results, even with 8 bits, but I would have rather shot it in 10 bits so I could do more flexibility. So it's the flexibility of your files that you will get. Um, and if you shoot HDR, which is getting quite big now, I mean, Netflix and, and other uh, platforms are using it all the time, you really need 10 bits. And why, use, why to use Vlog is that you, uh, you have so much you can do in the post-production. It is a little more, a bit more difficult to, to work with the, uh, the files and the grading but you have a lot more you can do. It's kind of like shooting raw in stills, I would say. And sometimes I even prefer shooting vlog over raw that I do for stills. Oh, so, really? But would yeah, you I recommend think... that if somebody were to buy this camera today for primarily doing video work, would you recommend that they buy the vlog upgrade right away? Or is that something that they might be able to wait a bit with? I would say if you, if you know why you need or want Vlog, then just go ahead and buy it because then it's going to be a no-brainer. But I think um, it, it's, it's kind of, um, it's an extra workflow and you need to get into it and really get to know why you want Vlog in the first place. So I think, in, in terms of investment, if you want to invest in, in the upgrade, which is, is not a lot of money, but it gives you a, a different color science that is quite unique for our cameras, and especially the, the professional uh, Varicam 35, which is the original camera that had the, the V-Log. So it gives you a very nice color science 
to be added to this camera. So for that, it's, it's a really low price, I think. So I have run into, you know, trying to choose a format when I film stuff. And uh, right. I think there is a lot of confusion out there about the uh, all intra and long GOP and what the difference right. is and what the benefits of the two different ones are. Could you talk a little bit about that and what you prefer to use? Absolutely. Uh, when, I, when I shot this short documentary, I wasn't using all intra, which is the highest bit rate you can get from this camera. And they also the highest quality, of course. But sometimes, sometimes you, you should just consider uh, how much storage you want to you want to use on on your uh, on your shot, uh, because it takes up, of course, much, much more storage if you go 400 megabits, which is the highest bit rate. So the highest bit rate is 400 megabits. And we call it intra, because the compression of each frame is is just separate. So there's not a lot of frames that are grouped together and kind of compressed together. So what it means in reality is that you get a little bit better uh, motion cadence, we call it. Uh, it's, it's like the motion you get if you watch it on a big screen just looks better. It just, you don't get those subtle artifacts you can get sometimes when you do pannings and stuff like that with a lesser codec. So the alternative is the long gop, uh, which is a 150 megabits codec with 10 bits 422 internally, uh, which I think is a fantastic codec and I use it most of the time. The 400 megabits, that's also 422 uh, and it's intra frame codec. Um, it's just a little bit easier to handle the 400 megabits in your computer. Yeah, so I if have you really have, noticed uh, that actually, uh, trying yeah, to edit the files that I have shot, uh, I realized yeah. pretty quickly that I had a computer that was just a little bit too old. Uh, so yeah. moving over to the all intra, sacrificing the uh, space, I got back a lot of performance in the editing suite later. Right. Yeah, that's right. And, and the reason for that is that since the camera is not compressing the frames into large groups, it's just so much easier for the computer to just unpack every frame, just frame by frame oh, like okay. that. So it doesn't need to kind of take the group of picture and, and decompress it, and then you can edit it. So it's just a lot easier. And also, there's one question that comes up quite easy, um, quite often. Uh, it's why is it not shooting ProRes? Because there are some other cameras in the market that can do it. And the reason is, is quite simple. I would say that ProRes is a proprietary format from another manufacturer that is really good for editing, but there's also um, a lot to think about in terms of battery life uh, and efficiency in the codec. We shoot to SD cards here. And these little small cards, you don't want to have way too large files on them. So, so when you shoot 400 megabits, it is actually very close to the quality you get in ProRes because it's a little bit more efficient. It takes a little bit more from your computer but it's still intra codec, which also ProRes is. So essentially, it's like 400 megabits versus maybe 600 to about 600 to 800 megabits for, for a ProRes in the same size. And there's not a lot of difference in the quality you get out. It's just that the files are smaller. They are a little bit heavier on the computer than ProRes on a Mac, but it's just about the same quality. So there you go. I think we've got some question here now. So yes, can you yeah. use vlog at 8-bit or 10-bit um, lower 4K settings like 150 megabits? Yeah, definitely. You can, you can use uh, vlog at both 10-bit and 8-bits um, and also with the lower bit rate. So you don't need to shoot in 400 megabits 10-bit just to be able to get uh, using uh, vlog. Um, on the other hand, if you shoot, for instance, like I did here in a movie, I shot a lot of stuff in 8 bits at 50p, 4K, 
uh, and that's also 150 megabits. It is a bit dif more difficult to, to get your skin tones right and, and not to get it right because it's the same color, you know. Uh, it, it's just uh, more uh, risk, more things that could go wrong in your editing if you, have, if you use a lot of LUTs and if you pull your material like this in editing, it's, it's going to show up some issues, especially uh, your, uh, your skies. A blue sky could be difficult sometimes. So I would recommend normally to shoot 10 bits for vlog, but if you know what you're doing, if you have tried out the LUTs and your editing beforehand, then you can quite easily go with uh, 8 bits. Uh, I have another question, actually. Uh, there's a function called VFR in this camera. Uh, yeah. And I've seen a lot of people talk about it. What does it do, and why are people liking it so much? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a feature called variable frame rate, VFR. Yeah. So variable frame rate, it's, it's working like this. You have... Uh, you have separated the sensor frame rate and the codec frame rate. So if you think about it this way, that you, you're shooting slow motion, uh, and you also get slow motion on your playback. So if you just hit playback in the camera afterwards, it will play it back to you in the real slow motion that you shot it. So the way that you set it up and why it's called variable frame rate is really that you set the sensor frame rate and you have already before chosen what codec and frame rate you want out from the camera. So if you uh, want, for instance, to still shoot in 25p HD on the output, and you put your sensor, the frame rate, to 100 FPS, then it's going to be four times slower when you play mm -hmm. it back. There is some... Uh, there are benefits and there are drawbacks with this, and one of them, the drawbacks, is that you get... you don't get the audio when you shoot this way. Because you have a variable frame rate, you don't want to end up with audio that is really messed up. So, so we're just not shooting in, in, uh, with audio. Uh, there is also no autofocusing uh, because of this. So you have to do that manually. About the autofocus, when you shot the shots you showed today, what did you use? Did yeah. you only focus manually, or I actually, and uh, this is this is something I I, I can be uh, a bit kind of uh, uh, thinking about if I did the right decision. But I was shooting in AF all the time, and and afterwards I did not have any problems with the clips. And with that said, I I would say that the autofocus in this camera is it's really good for some kinds of shots. Especially this kind of work, uh, I think it's great. Because when I was sitting there in the back of the car, I could just say that that was the least thing I wanted to, to think about, especially when I was shooting with a 400 millimeter lens equivalent to 800. That was impossible. But there are some things you learn when you use the camera, such as when you have that long lens on, it's, it's quite a bad idea to just you know, point it down while you are shooting, uh, because then you get back up, and it's going to take quite a long time before the autofocusing hits the target again, uh, b because you're all in the blur, right? So the longer lens, the more you need to think about just stop it and then uh, make a, a quick AF, which you can do when, when you're not recording. So when you're not recording with the camera, you just press it half down. It's going to be really quick to find the focus and then start it. So that sometimes I, I forgot about it, I put the camera down, and I was still recording, and I, I need to just stop and start it again, just to get quick AF. Um, but I think it, it, when it works good, it gives you really cinematic, kind of nice focus pulling like this. So I think that's what the camera was made for, to be really good at those nice cinematic pulls. Course, I have noticed this a lot uh, when I switch. Yeah. Uh, I do mostly nature photography uh, on my spare time. Oh, yeah. So when I switch from, say, a GH5S for the low light capabilities to the G9, 
I find that right. the G9, it goes straight to the focus point and just stops abruptly, while the yeah. GH5S and the GH5, it sort of sneaks up on it a bit more. It yeah. takes a little bit more time, but it looks a lot better in video. It does. Yeah, and, and I've talked to so many people using the GH5, and if you take all the the talk about the AF and just kind of bake it together into one cake, I think it, the 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 answer is that in sometimes in some scenarios it's fantastic, and in some scenarios it it kind of fails. And I think that's what a lot of cameras does really. It just does it differently uh, in 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 different scenarios. So so I was really happy to shoot with AF uh, and. For the other things I've done as well, um, I've got quite good confidence in shooting AF with this camera. Uh, so you, you you can do some some uh, uh, setups, some custom uh, settings for the video out of focus, and that that works pretty well if you get used to it. There are we're not going to go into detail today here with that, but there are a lot of good tutorials out there who uh, addresses that actually. And you can really adjust the autofocus system to your liking as well. So the speed absolutely you can tailor it so to, on. yeah, yeah. So we got a question here now. Uh, I found one drawback with my VF4, namely that you can't use it in 10 bit. That's right. Yeah, it is. It, it's limited to 8 bits. Um, so, it's, like you said, especially when I have a 24 FPS setup. Yeah. So. So sometimes that could be a limitation, um, really. Um, another question here, latest update yeah. really did wonders for autofocus. Yeah, it did. And I think the, the main update was really about um, getting a little bit more secure, not taking the background so easily. And I mean, there's a reason why it sometimes takes the background instead of your, your subject, because if you have a lot of stuff in the background, you have a lot of contrast there. So it's going to be a little bit distracted by that contrast and just try and go there instead. Yeah. I actually, so when I, I started at Panasonic, I got a GH5 with a 1.0 uh, software in it. Uh, so right. I went straight to the, say, not the late, yes, the latest now software. So from 1.0 to today's software. And it was just a huge difference. Yeah, that's, that's a really huge difference. Yeah, it's night and day. So, and I think there's that is a lot something work. that we at Panasonic take great pride in as well, that we support yeah, our cameras yeah. with updates and we keep supporting the professional line for quite a long Definitely. time uh, as yeah, well. Even, even, even over a long time, like I said, yeah, because the, the camera is three years now soon and, and it's it's still improving. So yeah, I think I think that's quite important if if you intend to have the camera to live a quite long life, really. Right. So do you think we've we got everything in there, Sebastian, that we thought about? Yeah, I think today? so. Are you happy? There are a couple well not just a couple, there are a lot of functions we could talk about, say the yeah, 4K yeah. cropping uh, function for doing uh, product work. Uh, maybe yeah. we should do a small video segment on that later, because uh, that's Absolutely. really wonderful if you have, say, a small YouTube channel or a store and want to show off your goods and, or something like that. Yeah. yeah also, one thing I, I, I think is worth to mention is that the GH5 is one of the very few cameras on the system camera market that can shoot with anamorphic lenses. Oh, yes. And, and yeah, you're a bit we, of an I, anamorphic nerd. I am, yeah. I admit that. And, and I think we, we, we also had, I think, the first uh, live stream we had, we had a question about if we're going to talk about anamorphics. So I think we should dedicate one episode for that only because that's a lot of nerdy talk. But yeah. um, I have a, an anamorphic lens here, which is an, an old um, camcorder lens, actually, from Panasonic, uh, which is called L LA7200. Uh, it, it was like a 16 by 9 conversion lens made for the DVX100 camcorder. And if you, if you pair it with the 1235, like I did here, it's actually a very good uh, 
lens if you want to start somewhere because you can shoot out of focus through that with the GH5. That's quite amazing. And also the camera can squeeze the anamorphic lens. If you don't know what an anamorphic lens is, the anamorphic lens is a, a lens that takes a wider picture and stretches that into a um, picture that looks quite weird if you don't de-stretch it um, and, and stretch it out again so you get a wider picture. And the camera can do that, so it can do it with different lenses as well. So essentially it takes the wide screen of a, say, a theater or a movie yeah. pro projection and it squeezes that down to the sensor on the camera uh, yeah. and then the camera just stretches it out again. Exactly. And that's why uh, Micro Four Thirds comes in really handy because most anamorphic lenses are made for four-third aspect. And the sensor itself here is four-third aspect. So what happens when you shoot in anamorphic mode here is that you can shoot up to 6K anamorphic. It's re really, in, in reality, it's, it's about 5,000 pixels roughly, a bit more than 5,000 5, um, on, the, on the wide end. And about 3,500, I think, is on the vertical. Uh, which is a really large picture with high resolution. It's basically 18 megapixels, I think. So when you put a, a lens like this on the camera, you get a look like this, um, a portrait of my daughter, and also here. So what you can see here from the background, if you look at the, the depth of field, the, the bokeh is quite different from when you're shooting with normal lenses. It's kind of like a 3D effect you get uh, and re some really nice flares you can get as well if you have a good light source pointed straight in. So yeah, that, that's a whole different kind of um, episode if, if we're going to talk all of the, the ins and outs of anamorphic lenses. But I think the GH5 is one of the best cameras to shoot anamorphic lenses because it has the the size of the sensor is really well adjusted to, to that kind of work. Also, the S1H is really good for anamorphic lenses. But the GH5, I mean, you have so much in there. You have also the stabilizer, which can work with anamorphic lenses. It's specially made for it. And I think that the price point of the GH5 and especially the lenses makes it really accessible to a lot of people. Yeah, so because even if you have a, you know, the money to start up with a S system right away, you might not have the money to get all the lenses that you need or want, right. <laughs> which is the reality yeah, yeah, for exactly, most of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then going for the Micro Four Thirds system that has a much bigger lineup of lenses and bigger variety there might be a much better uh, alternative. Absolutely. And also to wrap it up, I think I want to say that again, that the, the 1260 lens that comes in a package with the GH5, just consider buying it with that package, period. Just don't consider buying it without it. Uh, because even if you're planning to use manual lenses or other lenses, I think just having that in your bag is just going to change the way you work, really. Uh, yeah. Even just the, the look of the lens, um, the the quality you get. It's such like a when I was value. shooting up there. It is, yeah. It, it's it's really a cinematic looking lens and and um, good for videography and photography. So, okay. To to wrap up the question we had initially, why is it still awesome and why is it still a great camera after three years? Is I think it's everything that's packed in here that changes the way that you can work as a photographer and video maker. So there you go. So if you have any questions here, uh, just let us know in, in the comment section. We'll be happy to, to answer your questions here now in, in, uh, in a little time here. So we'll give you about yeah, some five or 10 minutes more just to see if there's questions coming up. So right. So do you think I covered it there, uh, Sebastian? Uh, yeah, I... I think so. You, you did yeah. well, Martin. Right. And it was only half an hour Thanks. long, so we only doubled our yeah. allotted time. That's quite good. Yeah, I could go for another hour. 
<laughs> Probably, <laughs> yes. And that's why I'm here. Yeah. yeah, that's great. You are my so, stopper sometimes. That's great. Uh, we don't seem to have that many questions now. I want to tell everybody that you can, of course, write uh, more questions in the comments when this comes up as a video on demand video as well. And we try yeah. to answer within 24 hours, but it's a bit dependent if we're out uh, doing something else at the moment. But just have some patience with us, and uh, we try to answer everything that we can. Yeah, that's right. Great. Okay, Martin, uh, I think that wraps it up pretty well. Yeah, I think. I think we covered most of it there. So uh, stay tuned. We're going to have some more stuff that involves the GH5, like anamorphic lenses. Why are you using them? Why are they fantastic? Uh, and also, I think we're going we're to come into this, this camera in a lot of other episodes, because it's, it's the center of things quite a lot of times. Yeah. But uh, this is just a little bit about why we love the camera still. So thanks a lot for watching today. And thanks, Sebastian, for helping me out. And thanks for having see me. See you guys later. Thanks a lot.